I want us to look tonight to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Oh, okay, go ahead. Got a praise report. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't that something? Praise God. Praise God. Oh, All right, go ahead. Pastor right. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Glory to God. You know, she's eight. What? I can't hear. Oh, oh, I thought she, she got, I thought you said she got healed. All right. I can't hear. I'm deaf in one ear and can't hear the other. What? I said you said you spoke it as though it was. Yes, and pray, pray that I can hear. <laughs> All right. Well, I got a praise report too. Uh, uh, Sunday morning, I was asking, I was telling about the Muslim lady, and uh, so uh, while after I went to sit down, uh, Debbie, Ardy's wife, she came and had a piece of paper said. Uh, give this message to this Muslim lady. And uh, basically it, it said, uh, you know, uh, don't be afraid, have faith. The Lord said, I've sent angels to be with you, and uh, I'm with you. You're going to see great miracles, not just you, but your family. Anything else can you remember? The family was included, and it was just a very encouraging and it was just right from the Lord. And then Debbie, after church, she, she didn't even remember what she wrote because she was under the power. Of the, she was just shaking when she came over there and, and tears in her eyes. So uh, I thought, now what's the best way to get this message to this lady? So uh, uh, she's on Facebook, so I sent her a private message. And I said, Is it, I, I've got a message from you from Jesus. It was given by someone in our church for you. Is it all right to send it here? She said, yes. So I, I sent her that message, and uh, she said, thank you very much. But then last night, she sent back, she said, that has helped me so much. She said, I want you to thank that. She, Debbie's not here tonight, but uh, uh, we'll tell her. But she said, thank her for, for that message. And I, I feel like it was for me, giving me directions what I need to do. And uh, I said, that's right. That's exactly what the Lord wanted you to do. And uh, he's, he's given you, you inst instructions of what, what you to do with your life. And so, and her family. So she's very encouraged by it. And she, she told me, I mean, and I'm, I'm hoping she'll be baptized one, sometime. But uh, she told me she won't be baptized when she gets ready. Her husband, is, he's, he's just that close. He's just really, really close to coming, coming to know Jesus. But it's, it's a big step, you know, uh, for Muslims in parts of the world, even in America. Some of them get killed for, you know. They uh, live in their debt. You know, these people come over here and they do pretty well. I mean, they, they get a convenience store and the whole family works, you know, and they open up 6 o'clock in the morning, still open at midnight. He's bought a lot of property. He's got several rent houses around and, so they live in one of his houses, and and uh, she said, if, if my dad finds out, he'll probably put us out of of the house, you know. So it's it's a it's a big step, and uh, if it goes back to Pakistan, they go back to Pakistan and visit. She could be killed, you know. Uh, it's a huge step. So so some people think, well, you know, she hasn't been baptized yet, she hasn't received the Holy Ghost yet, but hey, it's a big big step from Muslim to confess that they believe in Jesus Christ. And the Lord said, rejoice, the angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance before they're baptized, before they receive the Holy Ghost. Heaven rejoices over a sinner that comes to repentance. And we've prayed with this lady, and, and she's confessed her sins, and she's confessed that Jesus is her Lord, Jesus is her Savior. And she's asked Jesus to come into our life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, that's a big step. Praise God. I wouldn't belittle it at all. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that God's going to lead her on more. Okay, we won't need to pray for uh, the 
Pastor Chance's mother. Okay. All right. Uh, you can remain seated. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for this dear mother. For complete healing, Lord, you see the situation. You're the great physician. Lord, you heal people regardless of their age we, or their condition. We know in the mighty name of Jesus that you can heal or stretch forth your hand even now, Lord, and touch her in the mighty name of Jesus Christ with a complete healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord healed my mother-in-law of cancer when she was about 91 years old. They gave her just a few months to live. She lived to be 99. <laughs> no treatment, no surgery. She had had surgery and it came back. And uh, she died with no cancer in her body. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 99 years old. All right, let's look at the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was of little, little of stature. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He made haste and came down and received him joyfully, when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Jesus Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to that, this house, for as much he also is a son of Abraham. Now let's look at Revelation 3, verse 20. You may wonder what the connection is, but uh, I hope to make that clear before we're through tonight, these two passages. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice, this is Jesus speaking here, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I want to call this holy desperation. Jesus did something that seems to be out of character for, for, for the Lord. He invited himself into Zacchaeus' house. Now, I grew up calling him Zacchaeus, but my wife informs me it's Zacchaeus. <laughs> and she's usually right about things like that. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I will say Zacchaeus, unless I forget, and I may call him Zacchaeus. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of out of character for Jesus. You don't find him inviting himself into people's houses, you know. And it, it usually he waits for an invitation. Like uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me, or fellowship together. Now, someone saw this picture, and this is a famous artist, and you, you probably have heard the story, a famous artist uh, conception of Revelation 3.20 of Jesus knocking on the door. And, and somebody looked at the, that picture one time and said, that artist made a terrible mistake. He didn't put a doorknob on the door. And somebody said, no, that's not a mistake at all. The doorknob's on the inside. It has to be opened from inside. Jesus doesn't open the door. He waits for you to open the door for him. But here we see in, 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 uh, in, in this occasion in Luke, we, we see him inviting himself to Zacchaeus' house. Now, why did he do, do this? I, I'm calling this holy desperation. Now, Zacchaeus did something that was pretty radical. He, he, he climbed a tree to see Jesus. Sometimes when we do something radical for the Lord, we get great results. We go through the routines of life, and, and we receive normal blessings, you know. But sometimes you have a holy desperation that grips your soul. It may be that you want to see someone saved. You may, it may be that you have a sickness you want to be healed or you have a special need. You just get desperate before the Lord. You want a loved one saved or, or something. Or you may want to draw, we may want to draw closer to the Lord. There, there's been times in my life that I, I, I got you know, very concerned and I thought, Lord, I, I don't feel your presence like I, I want to feel your presence. And so I began to do something out of the, 
ordinary, something a little more radical, something a little more, you know, to pray some more, to, to fast some. And, and these, these are, are acts of desperation, you know, uh, uh, calling out to the Lord, witnessing, giving, whatever it is, more intense worship. Sometimes, you know, we, uh, we go through the motions of worship, and, but sometimes we have to be more intense in our worship. What do you mean being intense in our worship? You know, uh, a lot of the songs, I like, the, I like a variety of songs. I like the old ones. I like the new ones. I, I you know, praise and worship songs. It's, it's, it's powerful. I, I love the new songs that have been written. But uh, uh, some, many of the old songs, <clears throat> you know, we don't even have to think about it. Our mind can be on vacation, and we can just sing those words because we've heard them all of our life, and we've sung them hundreds of times. We don't even know what we're I, I say we. I should say I don't even know what I'm saying sometimes. I'm just singing it because I know them so well. And uh, I was preaching a revival in, up in Tennessee, and, and uh, there was uh, a family, a group of people that got up to sing. I don't remember if it was a quartet or something. Uh, and uh, they were very talented, and uh, it was one of those old, old songs. And I'm not against old songs. But I sat there, and I thought, these people seem sincere. They're very talented. You can play the guitar very well. Uh, and, you know, gifted. But I don't feel anything. And nobody else seemed to be feeling anything. I said, Lord, what's wrong? It just seemed like he spoke to me and said, these people have sung this song so much <laughs> that they don't even think about what they're singing. You know, it just, just comes out. It becomes such a habit, such a part of you. And uh, I, go, I go through things in, in my life. Sometimes I, I find myself singing some of these old songs that I haven't heard in a long time, and they bring a blessing. But... Uh, we have to become desperate sometimes for the Lord. So become more intense in our worship, more concerted in our efforts to, to worship the Lord. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, sing a new song unto the Lord. What are we talking about, ho holy desperation? Sing a new song, you know. I like to do some things a little different in my own devotional time with the Lord. And, and so sometimes I'll make up a song. Just make one up. I'm not a songwriter. Probably ain't nobody else would get anything out of it. But it means something to me. I just make up words and sing them to the Lord because the Bible says sing a new song. And sometimes when I'm reading the scripture, I'll, I'll, I'll sing what I'm reading. And I like, to, I, read and I like to have my devotional time by myself. You know, my wife says, you can't sing. I say, yeah, I know that. There's only one, there's only one that likes my singing, and that's Jesus. And he likes it so much, he just draws real close when I sing. I guess that's one, one reason Brother Davis and I was such a close friend. Neither one of us could sing. <laughs> I stood by him one time during service. I thought, man, he's worse than I am. <laughs> but uh, sometimes we have to get uh, desperate, you know, to, to, to get results we want. Now, Zacchaeus was short, the Bible said, and he couldn't see over the crowd. Verse 3 of Luke 19 he says he could not see for the press. Now, he, Jesus healed a blind man uh, there at Jericho named Bartimaeus. But Zacchaeus was blind in one sense of the word. He couldn't, see, he couldn't see over the crowd. The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So his eyes were so close to the ground that he, he couldn't see above. Too many people around him, you know. So he, he did something out of the ordinary. So the Bible said that Jesus was passing through Jericho. Now, according to that, if you read the, ver the first verse, he was passing through Jericho. He had no intention, it seems, from that uh, of stopping, of doing anything. He was on his way somewhere else. Jericho was just a spot in the road on his, on his destination, on his journey. But there were two desperate people there that delayed him and slowed him down to where he was going. Where was Jesus going? He was going to Jerusalem, and he was going to be crucified. So, uh, so this man, this little man, short of stature, did a radical thing and got Jesus' attention and slowed him down, even enough time to have a meal at his house. We do radical things sometimes. Repentance is radical because it brings a radical change in our lives. That we give up some things, you know, and uh, we lay aside some things. And, uh, you know, some people could do a Daniel's fast, and I've heard people make fun of the Daniel's fast. Hey, that's hard. 
But Daniel's fast as hard. I just about soon almost fast complete without any food is try to do a Daniel's fast. That's, that's tough, you know. And, but I've heard people make fun of it. I don't accomplish anything. Well, sure it accomplishes anything. Something. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm going to give up the Internet for a while. Whatever you do, and spend that time for the Lord. Whatever you do, something radical, something different, to get some results. Amen. So as Jesus is on the way through this place, he, the Bible tells us in verse 2, that Zacchaeus was chief uh, among the publicans, and he was rich. There are three things we find out in verse 2, this very, very short verse. That uh, first thing we find out about him is his name is Zacchaeus. What does that mean? Zacchaeus means pure or innocent. Now, he was everything but pure and innocent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when his... He was born, his mother and dad looked down at that innocent little face, you know, and looked so innocent and pure, they named him pure, Zacchaeus. But the people in Jericho didn't think he was very pure. He, he, he was a tax collector, a publican. Now, I didn't say Republican, he was a publican. <laughs> he wasn't a Democrat either. He was, he was a publican, which meant he was a tax collector, and the Bible said he was a chief among the tax collectors. He was over a bunch of tax collectors. So what, what does that mean, okay? It meant that he worked for Rome. The Jews hated the Romans. He sold his country out. He became very rich because you, you bought the public would buy a certain area of jurisdiction from Rome to collect a certain number, amount of taxes from that. Whatever he could collect above what was specified for Rome, he kept for himself. So he would exact high taxes. The Bible says that his name was Zacchaeus, pure. People probably laugh. Here comes pure. Here comes innocent. Man, he got the wrong name, didn't he? So uh, he, uh, the Bible said also he was very rich. He was a rich man. He but his empty inside. Wealth couldn't buy him what he wanted. The third thing we find out about him, this verse, being a publican, he was ostracized from the temple. He could not get in the temple because he had betrayed his country, sold out to Rome, and here he was, a tax collector. You know, what if, God forbid it ever happened, but what if we were taken over some country? foreign country, and they oppressed us, and, you know, and, and some of us will say, well, I'm going I'm to work for them, I'm, and I'm going to make you folks pay you. What, you. We wouldn't like it, would we? Well, that's, that's the way the Jews felt about Zacchaeus. He was making them pay, pay more than what they should pay, and pay to Rome at that. So they forbid him to go into the temple. So these things we know about him. Now, if we would have said somebody... But said to us, now Jesus is going to come, be coming through. He's really just passing through. But somebody's going to get his attention. He's going to stop and have dinner at somebody's house. Probably the last person you would have guessed would be Zacchaeus. Wow. Now, Jericho was the city of the priest. What does that mean? It was a city. There are certain cities set aside in Israel that were for the Levites. It was theirs. They owned it. That was their city. So there are a lot of religious folk in that city. A lot of people that would seem to be spiritual. A lot of people that would go to the temple and do sacrifices and everything like that. If Jesus is going to visit somebody and eat dinner at somebody's house, ah, it would be one of the priests. It would be one of those Levites because they're very religious and they're spiritual. But he said, no, it's going to be a publican, Zacchaeus. Oh, people would have been aghast. They would have been shocked. Jesus is going to eat. You know, Jesus has time for everybody. I think about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he tracks people, you know. There was a man called, called Z Simon Zelotes. That wasn't his last name. That describes who he was. Zelotes that is zealot. He was a zealot. That would be like uh, Ku Klux Klan or the, maybe that's a little far out, but 
It, would be, it, it was a, 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 a very, very patriotic. So those on the extreme right, you know, we have conservatives and we have liberals. Well, this guy would be a extreme on the right side. He, anything that smacked of a loyalty to another country, man, he would be ready to kill him. Simon the Zealot. He hated tax collectors more than anybody else because he was a zealot. But he was a disciple of Jesus. And then you have Matthew, Levi. Who was he? Well, he was, he was like Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. These two guys, one from the, one extreme and one from the other extreme, in fellowship every day. And we never read where they failed to get along. <laughs> They had different political views. You know, Matthew or Levi would say, well, you know, might as well try to get along with Rome. They're, they're here and they own us, so we might as well try to get along with them. But uh, that was his background. And Simon's background said, no way. Let's rebel. Let's revolt. Let's, let's kill those Roman soldiers. Let's drive them out. But they found common ground at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that just like us? Amen. The church. We may have different views about certain things, but we get a lo we love each other, don't we? And socially, we may be, you know, different. There are people come in. There's people been people come in here that's homeless. We've had people homeless people come in here, and they were loved and made to feel welcome. And we had a very wealthy couple that came here a couple of Sundays ago. And they were touched by the Spirit of God. At the feet of Jesus, there's common ground, you see. A zealot and a, tax, a former tax collector together every day and never a problem. Praise God. That's the way it ought to be. <laughs> Amen. We all love each other. We're diverse. We love each other because we belong to the same family. Now, Zacchaeus, he, he climbed a sycamore tree. Now, a sycamore tree, we, we had one in the front yard and one in the back yard. When we moved where we are, both of them died, and we had to do away with them, cut them down. But a, a sycamore tree is slick bark. It's hard to climb. It's a long way to that first branch. And this guy was short. You know, you can just imagine. Just, here's, what, would you, what would you see, think, if there was a parade coming down the, down the road, and here's a, a rich man, you know. And a three-piece business suit. He's running down the head of that parade. He's, he's got to find a place. And he finds a tree and he's jumping up there, dressed up in his suit. I think, man, that guy's crazy. <laughs> That's how desperate he was to see Jesus. The Bible said he ran ahead of the crowd. You can see that guy running out there. there. In the eastern part of the world, men didn't run. Very, very seldom did a man run. Because that was a show of lack of dignity. A man was to be dignified. So in the Eastern culture, it was very rare for a man to run. But I think of two cases in the Gospels where men ran. One was the prodigal's father. It was very, very uncommon for any man to run. But an old man, it was very, very, especially uncommon for an old man to run. So the prodigal's father, who represented God, when he saw that son returning from the far country, what did he do? He ran to meet him. Amen. That's how anxious the Father was to restore that fellowship. That's how much God loves us. The, the prodigal's father, he forgot all about his dignity, you know, his status in the community. If there were neighbors around, they looked out the window and saw him running down the, that lane there, you know. What in the world has got into him, you know? Well, his wayward son has come home. That's what's got into him. You mean the one that spent everything that he had, all of his inheritance, wasted all that money his dad gave to him? He's running to meet a guy like that? Yeah, that's how much a father loves him. That's how much a father loves you and me. You know, when people fail, the Lord, the devil sells them a lie. So you might as well quit praying. God doesn't love you. Look how much you messed up. You know, God doesn't love you anymore. When in reality, the Lord is so warning us to come back to him. He's so warning us to draw close to him. You know, the son thought he will just 
show me a way probably. I'll just tell him I'll just be a servant. I don't expect anything else. I'll be a servant. And he was trying to make a speech and his dad was just saying, hush boy, I got a best robe for you. Here, put it this on. I got a fatted calf they're killing. We're going to have a feast after all. Here, put this ring on your hand. The ring was a special ring. It was a signet ring. In other words, he has opened up his bank account again to this prodigal son who had just came back home. I've known the people, you know, they, they, they go out in the world and they mess up and come back to church. Some churches, well, you sat there six months or you sat there a year and uh, sat there three years, you know. Uh, we might let you uh, back in, you know, be a member. But man, the father put that ring, that signet ring, which he could transact all, but all of the father's wealth was at his success because he had the ring. That's how much God loves us. And then we see the other man running was, I can think of, Zacchaeus. I don't know of any other. Maybe you do, but that's all I can think of. He ran ahead of the crowd. He ran down there to climb a tree. Zacchaeus was acting like a little boy. You know, here's a grown man, dignified position. Probably the richest, if not the richest, one of the richest men in Jericho. And he's standing down the street running for all he's worth. And he sees a tree, and the man, he's jumping, trying to get up there. And he finally catches it, and he, he climbs up there, and he probably figures he's hid. Among, you know, sycamore tree leaves are very big leaves, you know. So he probably thought, man, I'm hid here. Nobody's ever going to see me. I, I can get a good look at him when he passes by. And, uh, you know, he probably doesn't have time for me. I'm a tax collector, you know, and he's, he's the Messiah. And he's going to, you know, at that time they thought, what the Messiah was going to do is going to kick the Romans out. The Messiah was going to bring in an army and drive all the Romans out, you know. And that's so he, he's Zacchaeus. Can you get his mindset? I work for Rome, so he doesn't have time for me, but I want to see him. Holy desperation. And you know, as I began to study this, I saw things I'd never seen before. Never thought of before. But when Jesus got there and Zacchaeus thought he's hidden among the foliage of the tree, Jesus stopped. And looked up. Zacchaeus. How did Jesus know his name? That's right. He knows everybody. I never noticed that before. Jesus has never met Zacchaeus before, as far as we know. But he called his name. Zacchaeus, come down. Make haste. Hurry up. Hurry up. Come on down. Out of that tree. Because I'm going to go to your house today. He invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. Now Zacchaeus... In his wildest imagination, what do you want out of this trip? What is your highest expectation of getting up in that tree? What is the most that you would expect? He probably would have said, knowing his mindset and what, how they viewed things in that part of the world, their culture and everything, oh, I, I just want to see him. I've heard he's healed blind eyes. I've heard he's caused the deaf to hear and, and uh, lame to walk. I just want to see somebody like that. Was a kiss? Do you think he'll stop and talk with you? Oh, no, no. He, he, he wouldn't have time for me. But lo and behold, Jesus stops on that tree, looks up at him, says, come on down. Be quick about it. Come on. Come on down, Zacchaeus. We're going, I'm going to go to your house today. He invited himself. Let's look at Luke 8, 7, 18, 17. 18, 17, Luke. Verily, I say unto you, Jesus is talking there. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. We come to him as a little child. Amen. Come to him as a little child. That's what Zacchaeus was doing. Running, climbing a tree, like a kid trying to get a good spot for a parade. You know? Like a little child. The Bible says that's how we must become as childlike in our faith. I've told this story many, many years ago. Some of you probably might remember it, and I've done similar things since. But, but uh, like I say, I get a little crazy sometimes with devotion to the Lord, and it's the reason I like to I like to pray with my wife. But I, I really, uh, when it comes to bearing my soul before, I like I like to be alone. You know, I might want to do something crazy. You know, so I, uh, they were all going to bed one night. All, all of our kids were home, so I put on a pot of coffee. That was really a burden, and we hadn't been pastor of the church there too long across town, and things things are pretty difficult. I remember owed a lot of money, 
I got a phone call. People found out the new pastor was here, and they hold, held bonds, you know. Well, maybe get get our money. And they knew when the church time was. It was Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So I get phone calls. Hey, you new pastor, I want my bond. Pay off my bond for me. So I'm trying to get, you know, ready for church. And one night, I believe it was a Wednesday night, phone rings. And this guy says, uh, I'm Mr. So-and-so, certain bank here in uh, Waco. He said, I understand you're the new pastor. I said, yes, I am. He said, welcome to Waco. I said, thank you. He said, now I've got rid of the pleasantries. I've got something to say that you may not like too well. <laughs> and he said, so-and-so has used a bond from your church as collateral, and his note is due. And he says, I want the money. It's past due. He said, I don't want no. He says, you pay or else, and you're not going to like my else. <laughs> so that, those type of things was my introduction to Waco. It seemed like almost every service I get a phone call, you know, because they knew Sunday night, that's when church is going to be here. Wednesday night, get these calls, new pastor, maybe we can get our money, you know. I remember my mother came through, and she said, son, how's things going? I said, mother, I'll tell you what, I got a call on the banker here. I got to have $2,000 down at the bank. Or else. <laughs> now I've been to the church so many times. They've been so good. Church folks have been so good. I mean, we're always taking up offerings, it seemed like. And she says, well, son, how much is it? I said, $2,000, mother. She says, well, I'll write a check for it, son. She wrote a check, $2,000. So things were kind of tough, you know. So I, I was under a lot of pressure. And so bondholders called them. Man, bondholders. And, and, uh, and a lot of folks didn't like me too well. <laughs> That's, that's neither here nor there, but, but uh, I, I, uh, I was desperate one night, everybody going to bed, so I thought, I got to do something, I got to do something. I prayed and said, Lord, let me leave here, and the Lord said, you can't leave. The Lord said, I called you, you can't go. I get, I get in that office, I pray, and said, Lord, let me leave. I can't, I can't stay here. I, I know I made... I made mistakes and everything. But I said, uh, I, just can't, I just can't make it. And the Lord said, this is where I want you to stay put, stay here. So one night I made a pot of coffee. They were all going to bed. I had to do something radical. I needed help, you know. I needed help. I get up to preach. Sounded like the sermon went over the side of the pulpit. I mean, I didn't feel anointed. No wonder they didn't like me. I, I couldn't be anointed no matter what I tried. And so I got a call to come preach a rally over at Walnut Springs. And all week long, I thought, I, I, I can't preach. Why do they want me to preach a rally? And I debated. I said, I should call and tell them to get somebody else. And I, I, go, I pick up the phone. I, I don't know. Even to Friday, and I finally I thought, well, it's too late to call. I got to go preach. Man, I got up to preach. I thought I was going to explode. Anointed. Wow. I said, I got it back. Praise God. I got it back. <laughs> Sunday morning, I go to church all excited. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Right there. So, no anointing. Nothing. Dry. Dry as corn chokes. People didn't get anything out of it. Yeah. God wasn't anointed. So I made that pot of coffee. I'm desperate. The Lord says, you've got to stay here. You can't leave. This is where I want you. So I poured two cups of coffee. I went to the head of the table where I normally sit, and I said, Jesus, pull out a chair. I said, would you please sit here? Have a cup of coffee with me. I've got to talk to you. I poured myself a cup of coffee. I went around and sat where one of the kids sat. And you know, sometimes we pray, and sometimes we agonize before God, we scream, and we get loud. But sometimes we just need to have a little talk with Jesus. Right. Just a little talk with Him. Right. Jesus, please let me talk to you. I just talk to Him, just quiet, just like I'm talking to you. And Lord, I'm discouraged, and we've got all these debts, and people are calling, trying to collect money. I can't get anointed. 
I can't preach anymore, at least not in my church. I can preach everywhere else, but I can't preach. I can't preach here. I need your help, Lord. Man, I just poured out my soul. I felt so much better. Just sitting there talking, looking at that place, that chair, just talking to Jesus. I told this story with North Carolina pastor. It's going to be kind of a smart lady. came over and said, well, said, you enjoyed your coffee. What did Jesus think about it? I said, man, he enjoyed it more than I did. How do you know? I said, well, he got so excited, he forgot to drink his coffee. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, if you're not going to drink that coffee, I don't want it to go to waste. Can I have it? <laughs> so I drank my coffee and drank Jesus too. I said, how did he like man? He, re- he liked it. And somewhere along in there was a turning point. Somewhere the anointing came back. And, and somewhere I, I could preach again and folks get a little something out of it. Praise God. So Jesus knew who he was. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to your house. So everybody was shocked. You know, he's going to a publican's house to eat. You know, that'd be about like, a, you know, Democrat and Republican sitting down to dinner, you know. <laughs> Just be about the size of it, you know. So uh, here they're sitting there and just enjoying a good time, good meal, all that. Verse 7 of Luke 19, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, It was going by to be a guest of a man that is a sinner. And Jesus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. I've taken anything from any man by false accusation. I restore him fourfold. Now, he was, people made fun of him, or or ridiculed rather. Jesus, going here, uh, said he shouldn't have done it. Going to the center, they got plenty of priests here. They got plenty of Levites. Why didn't he go to Levite's house? Well, they're too stinking self righteous, that's why. They feel like they're good enough already. Jesus is looking for some sinners he can bless. He said, I didn't come to call those that are well to to, uh, uh, minister to. I came to call the sick. Reminded of the story the uh, preacher went to preach in prison. And he'd walk along after after the service and talk to him through the bars. He said, Pastor, I'm, I'm here. I'm falsely accused. I didn't do what they accused. One after the other, stories like that. I shouldn't be here. He came to one cell, and there's a man just booing, just crying his eyes out. And the preacher said, why are you here, son? He said, I've done so many bad things, and I've got what I deserved. I'm here. And I, I just, he said, praise God, thank the Lord. He said, why? You, you can get help. God can't help any of these other folks. They think they're innocent. But you know you're guilty. You know you have a need. That's the kind of people that Jesus can help. Zacchaeus said, I'm going to, he said he's going to live according to the word of God because that's what the law said. If you take things from you, restore fourfold. And he said, I'm going to give half my goods. Now he, he really is pure. Jesus made him pure. He lived up to his expectation of his parents when he was born. He became poor. Jesus has made the way open for anybody coming to the presence of the Lord. You, me, people that have failed, people that have messed up. The Bible says we have a high priest that was tempted in all points as we're tempted, yet without sin. Therefore, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in the time of need. Not that we're without sin, but because he's without sin, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Desperation. I think about David facing Goliath. That was a desperate act. I'm almost finished. Just a few more minutes. And I promise you I'll get you out before normal time. But David said, nobody's going to fight Goliath. I will. But you're just a boy. Put this armor on. No, it doesn't fit. I don't know how to use that. Take a slingshot. Five spoons. He didn't think he needed four shots at Goliath. But he was going giant. He wasn't going to stop to kill off. Goliath had four brothers. That's the reason David got five stones. And after four was all over with, they all died 
hands, not of David himself, but by his men. Now, here was a giant, Goliath, who was intimidating God's people. A whole army of people, they were intimidated by this giant. And really, who could blame them, you know? Because he's asking for one man to come out and fight. But a whole army cowering in fear. And David says, let me fight him. Now, that's pretty radical. With a slingshot, a stone. But he had something else that the giant couldn't see. He had the name of the Lord. He said, you come to me with your sword and your spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. I'm going to take your head off of you today. And he did. When David failed the giant, all it took was one person to bring an army. And all of Israel got involved then. They all chased after, their, after the uh, Philistines and conquered them because one man stood up. A final example, the disciples in the boat. Jesus came walking by. The boat was taken on water. It looked like for all the world they were going to sink. And Jesus came by, and he would have passed them by. Jesus goes where he's invited. That's the reason it's so surprising he invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. But he would have passed by. Somebody says, it's a spirit, it's a ghost. And somebody says, well, it looks kind of like Jesus. Well, it may be the Lord. Jesus, is that you? Yes. Peter said, Lord, if that's really you, let me come to you. On the water. Come on. Now, that's pretty radical. Here the waves are tossing to and for the wind is blowing. Peter gets up the side of that boat. He jumps off. Huh, man, it's like this floor under me. He begins to walk to Jesus. The disciples, they said, we're going to stay where it's safe in the boat here. Safe. The boat's going to sink. The only safe place was out there where Jesus is. So Peter said, I'm going to go where it's safe. I'm going to go out there where Jesus is. Something radical. But, but oh, some people say, oh, he, but he began to sink. He, he sunk. Yeah, he did. He walked a little while. Man, they used the nets, and they finally found old Peter's body, drug him out. Jesus preached his funeral. Oh, he tried to walk to me, but, man, he drowned. <laughs> That's not how it ends, is it? <laughs> I wish I could have helped him, man, he tried. No. That's, but you hear some people tell it, you know. Well, he walked on the water, but he sunk. <laughs> well, he walked on the water twice. He didn't sink the second time. Well, some people say, how do you know he walked on the water twice? How do you think they got back in the boat? right. They had to walk on the water back. To the, the reason he didn't sink this time because Jesus is holding him up. Praise God. The only reason he sunk the first time was because he took his eyes off of Jesus a little while. And that's what happens to us when we take our eyes off of Jesus a little while. You're going to sink. You're going to go down. But all you got to do is look back to him and say, hey, Jesus, please help me. He's not going to let anybody drown just getting out of the boat to come to him. You know, the people in the boat, you know, they never got out of the boat. They don't know the exhilaration of Peter. the only man other than Jesus that knows what it's like to walk on water. At least I don't know of any of them. Well, desperate situations. David saved Israel. One man act. Peter saved 11 other men beside himself that night. One man took action. All of them were going to drown. But he got out of the boat and went to Jesus. And these three things here I see in Zacchaeus, David, and Peter. I see an example. Something significant. Zacchaeus represents us individually. We all have needs from the Lord. Doesn't make any difference how spiritual you are, how much you read the Bible, 
Come to church. Oh, that's good and fine, but there comes a time, a crisis time in your life when you really need Jesus. One preacher said it like this about trials. There's three things about trials. Either you're in one, or you just came out of one, or you're getting ready to go into one. So we need Jesus as individuals. So sometimes it takes a desperate ax. David and Israel, that's the type of the church. All of Israel, they were intimidated until David stood up. How many will it take to bring revival? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all you know, prayed as much as we should, fast as much as we should, faithful as much as we need to be, every one of us? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But you know that rarely happens. But one person can make a difference for a whole church. One person can make a difference for the whole church. Y'all remember Sister Bessie? I remember Sister Bessie. She worked for Brother Davis and worked for me until she got such poor health she had to, she had to quit. Bessie was a prayer warrior. Oh, man, was she a prayer warrior. One day there was a knock on my door. And I opened the door. The salesman was standing there. He was as white as a sheet. He was scared to death. He came by the salesman. And others out of that prayer room, Bessie was praying. And man, you've ever heard Bessie pray? Wow. I mean, she prayed, uh, not a whisper. I mean, she got desperate. She was crying out to the Lord. This man never heard anything like that. Scared him to death. So he came, he came on in, you know. He got an introduction, praise God. <laughs> First Pentecostal church. Man, they pray here. But, you know, Sister Bessie died. I know after a while, things were getting kind of rough. and Things happening. And why is this happening? Why is that happening? You know? Why? Why are things all of a sudden just begin to seem to come apart at the seams? And the Lord spoke to me. Nobody's taken Bessie's place. Nobody's took Bessie's place. What did Bessie do? She wasn't a very good bookkeeper. She didn't know how to file stuff. She knew where it was, but nobody else could find it. Praise God. Praise Jesus. <laughs> but... but what did Bessie, somebody say, what did Bessie do? Well, she answers the phone at the church, and you know, and her voice is kind of, you know, kind of rough voice, you know. Hello. <laughs> First Pentecostal church. <laughs> I'm not making, she was sweet. I'm not making fun of her, but her voice wasn't really that pleasant, you know, as far as answering the phone. File, she get, what did Bessie do? Bessie was a prayer warrior. Yeah. Bessie held the church together with her prayers. Amen. And I said, Lord, Why? Are things happening like they are? Nobody took Bessie's place. Church, 150, 200, 300 people. One person. I mean, man, everybody's important. Don't get me wrong. But that one lady, she knew how to pray, man. She knew how to pray. I remember, don't try to guess. You probably can guess who it was, but I'm not going to tell. Man called me up. <clears throat> He said, Brother Fuller, i got to meet you. I said, okay, where can we meet? I said, well, uh, Barnes & Noble will be all right. So I met him at Barnes & Noble. And he said, man, i got to apologize to you. I said, what's wrong? He said, i got a call from Bessie today. Man, she chewed me out. She said, you've been criticizing my pastor. <laughs> you call him and apologize to him. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so. I wasn't planning on telling that, but that was Bessie. You know, she held things together. Praise God. You know, you said something last night when you started to preach. Anybody ever criticized Brother Chance? You know, you're going to have you to deal with. Well, you know, that was Bessie, man. You don't criticize the pastor. You don't criticize Brother Davis. You don't criticize Brother Fuller. Because you'll get a phone call. You go apologize to my pastor. And this man was sweating, man. He wasn't afraid of me. He was afraid of Bessie. So, Bessie, 
wasn't much of a secretary, wasn't much of a filer, really not that great at answering the phone, you know. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> but but she, she was a great prayer warrior, and that made up a lot of stuff. Praise God, made up for everything. Amen. She kept things together. Finally, Peter, leaving the boat, the boat represents the world. What we can do for all, our world, one man dared to get out of the boat and brought Jesus back on board and saved a sinking ship. What can one person do for prayer? And nation? They say some of the greatest revivals that has happened in the history of the world happened when people prayed. The great Welsh revival, a few little schoolgirls, if I remember right, about 10 years old, the great Welsh revival in 1904, 1906 that shook the world. Schoolgirls praying, seeking the Lord. I preached down in Mexico, Baja, California, a few years ago. Brother Kathy and I went down, and I, I preached down there. A big church, huge church, full of young people. Fire on fire for God. Souls being saved. People radically changed. What was the secret of that church? Young people, junior high, high school age kids, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Something radical. And they prayed before they went to school. And ours too. Pray and seeking the Lord. So one person got out of the boat. Jesus, we need you. He walked to Jesus and got Jesus back in the boat. People praying for our nation, people praying for our world. We can make a difference. You can make a difference. You know how to pray. You know how to touch God. We may not be able to pray like Sister Bessie. She was one of a kind. But we all, our prayers are powerful, powerful, powerful. All you have to do is just pray. That night I had the coffee with Jesus. That was powerful. It was powerful. Because I needed help. I really did. Holy desperation. Are you going through something? Get desperate. Is it finances? Is it home? Is it spiritual? Do loved ones need to be saved? Get desperate before the Lord. Pray a little more, fast a little more, whatever it is. Let's stand together. God bless you.